Hello folks, this is Tommy Saldor's episode 35, and today something a little bit different. Instead of the usual guest, I am bringing you a recording of a live talk by Porrick Fogarty from Irish Wildlife Trust titled Whittled Away, Ireland's Vanishing Nature. Porrick was our guest in episode 20 of the podcast, so go check it out, and he's also an author of the book under the same title, Whittled Away. The book is obviously available online, on Amazon and whatnot. Just Google Whittle Away and you'll find it, no problem. So, last Wednesday, Porrick was invited by the Kildare branch of Birdwatch Ireland to give that talk, and so I thought it's a pity that that talk won't be streamed or even recorded. So I contacted the organizers Tom McCormack and Brendan Murphy from Birdwatch Ireland, and with their permission, I recorded the talk. So here you have it. Irish Wildlife Trust campaign officer Porrick Fogarty and his talk for the Kildare branch of Birdwatch Ireland whittled away Ireland's vanishing nature. Oh, and uh, don't forget to buy the book. Good evening, everybody. Um, this evening we have Parig Fogarty with us, who is an ecologist an environmental scientist who has been chairman of the uh, Irish Wildlife Trust from 2009 to 2013. He was also editor of the Irish Wildlife magazine from 2009 up to 2017 and is currently acts as their campaign officer. He is the author of Whittled Away, Ireland's Vanish Vanish Vanishing Nature, which is the title of his talk again this evening. I heard Porrick for the first time last week uh, when he addressed a subcommittee of the Dáil um, on the Oireachtas station on RTE. Um, he, he made a presentation along with, I'm not sure if any of you know, uh, Catherine Farrell from Bordnamona was before him, as well as Catherine O'Connell from IPCC. And they were talking about... Um, biodiversity of our boglands, etc., and maybe how we'd preserve them into the future. I certainly think that we're going to give Parig uh, far more attention than the half the committee that showed up for the presentation, which was a disgrace in, in, in my mind, but um, that's for another day, I suppose. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me hand you over to Parig Fogarty. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, and uh, thank you all very much for uh, for coming here this evening. And um, so, um, as Tom said, I wrote this book a couple of years ago, and uh, what I was trying to achieve by writing the book was to uh, get a sense to people just how much nature has disappeared from uh, from Ireland in in the last decades. Um, I had been. Uh, working on a lot of these issues uh, as chairman of the Irish Wildlife Trust. And even though, you know, we were getting some traction in the media, let's say, or we were getting some attention on various issues, whether it was overfishing or uh, farming or the peatlands, nobody really seemed to be putting all these things together into one picture. Uh, and I felt when you did put it together into one picture, it was quite compelling what was happening um, across the whole country. And, and so that's really what uh, what prompted me to write the book. Now, it was kind of after I wrote the book, and it was one sentence that, uh, that I wrote about that uh, kind of stayed with me. And it was, um, if our environment is so bad, if I'm saying it's in such bad condition, why do we not notice these things? Why, why is our standard of living so much better than it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago when the assumption is our environment was in much better condition? And... Um, I had trouble answering this question, really. This is one of the paradoxes that we live in today. On the one hand, we're talking about uh, enormous environmental difficulties. On the other hand, humanity has never had it so good. Um, so how can I square this uh, circle? And uh, one of the uh, things that uh, this got me thinking about was this idea of uh, the collapse of ecosystems. And, uh, and this is relevant because uh, we hear an awful lot about the collapse of ecosystems these days. And, uh, and I'm just going to read out one, a couple of headlines, actually. Um, this is from uh, uh, last year. And uh, 
It was a headline in the London Independent, and it said, Scientists warn of ecological Armageddon after study shows flying insect numbers plummeting by 75%. Of course, this is relevant as well this week. There was another study uh, that said something similar uh, this week. And then there was another uh, headline in the Guardian newspaper about a different topic, and it said, Europe faces biodiversity oblivion after the collapse in French birds. Uh, and the subtitle went on to say that intensive farming and pesticides could turn Europe's farmland into a desert that ultimately imperils all humans. And these kind of apocalyptic headlines are quite uh, common these days, but uh, people seem to be alarmed, but not an awful lot happens. People forget about them the next day. But it got me thinking about this idea of ecological collapse. What does it actually mean for an ecosystem to collapse completely? And there's not a huge amount of information on it, but the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, who you may be familiar with, they're the international body that um, comes up with lists of endangered species, and they have what's called a red list, and uh, species go on, mostly on it, sometimes they do come off it, uh, and they grade species with threatened uh, levels of extinction. Now, they also have a lesser known uh, list for ecosystems. And then it says here that an ecosystem is considered to be collapsed when it is virtually certain that its defining biotic and abiotic features, that's the living parts and the non-living parts, are lost and the characteristic native biota are no longer sustained. It goes on to say that collapse is a transformation of identity, a loss of defining features and or a replacement by a different novel ecosystem. Now, in the popular imagination, that's not exactly what ecosystem collapse looks like. This is a still from a film that came out a couple of years ago called Blade Runner 2. Uh, it was a, a sequel to uh, a, a very famous film that came out in the 1970s. And uh, the premise of the film is that all ecosystems have collapsed. And uh, humanity lives in a world that is completely dead, apart from humans, of course. And uh, humanity is confined to living in these miserable cities uh, that are overpopulated and uh, uh, no greenery and are pretty sad and lonely places. And the only reason they can survive, according to the film, is because our technology allows us to clean our air and to, uh, and to provide food. But ecosystem collapse, according to the IUCN, is not dead. It's not everything dying. Uh, and this may be where we're getting, uh, where we're missing the trick, I think, when it comes to these headlines about ecosystem collapse and, and Armageddon, etc. I think it's highly unlikely that life on Earth itself is going to be extinguished. But I think when we look at it uh, in terms of a transformation, that looks more likely. Now, I was thinking about uh, this recently. Uh, a few years ago, I was in Iceland. Iceland is a very popular place now to visit these days. And um, it's full of tourists. And one of the things that tourists will tell you about Iceland, that it's, so, uh, it's full of its dramatic landscapes and dramatic nature. And people uh, drive around and they visit the waterfalls and they visit the mountains and the volcanoes and everything. And it is spectacular. But it is also a completely collapsed ecosystem. Many of the landscapes look like this. It's a total desert. And um, Iceland wasn't always like this. Now, Iceland has uh, large areas of uh, ice uh, sheet. Uh, it also has volcanic rock that is, you know, next to lifeless. But when the Vikings arrived in Iceland about a thousand years ago, they found that about a third of the whole island was covered in forest. But they felled the forest for sheep and the uh, the harsh weather conditions in Iceland washed all the soil away. And that's why an awful lot of Iceland looks like this today. Nothing lives on it. And it got me thinking how people driving around, uh, stopping to take photographs, uh, can be completely oblivious to the fact that they're living in a collapsed ecosystem. Now, in many ways, there are some parallels between this and, and Blade Runner, because in Iceland, it's quite a rich country. People certainly uh, aren't uh, scraping the land trying to make a living. Uh, they import a lot of their food. They have uh, energy from under the ground, and they use a lot of that energy to grow their own food. Now, you can even get uh, salads, tomatoes and such, grown in, in greenhouses outside, uh, outside of Reykjavik. But is this what we're talking about? But it got me thinking about, uh, about Ireland and how we see our own landscape here in Ireland. 
Could we be driving around admiring the scenery? But actually, the whole living world has collapsed around us and pretty much nobody has noticed. Well, that's exactly what I think has happened. This uh, is a regular field and nothing lives in it apart from the grass. Uh, and it could be one type of grass, which is probably Italian rye grass or perennial rye grass that comes imported from somewhere else, uh, has no place in Irish ecosystems, is completely devoid of uh, flying insects, is completely devoid of nesting birds. And an awful lot of our country now looks like this. And it looks like this because modern intensive agriculture requires the reseeding of grasslands. That means every couple of years it's sprayed with herbicide and uh, ploughed up and reseeded so that anything that was living in the soil or on the soil um, uh, disappears. And then um, it, is, uh, it is sprayed with docks or, uh, with pesticides and herbicides uh, while it is a grassland. So, <clears throat> so this is a completely transformed ecosystem from what we had in terms of farmland uh, 50, 60 years ago where the fields were full of a diversity of plants the ground was not routinely ploughed. There were no chemical uh, fertilizers. And you would have had a range of biodiversity, including flying insects and uh, ground nesting birds in a field like this. Of course, before that, we had uh, a country that was covered in dense oak woodland. Uh, but that woodland now is uh, less than 1% of our land area. And even the tiny fragments of native woodland we have left all have serious problems associated with them, whether it's invasive species or lack of management or so on. So the woodland system collapsed. And then the farmland system that came after it has also collapsed. So what we have here is an utterly transformed uh, ecosystem. Now, of course, farmland isn't everywhere in Ireland and off. Most of Ireland is grassland like this, but not all of it. Uh, we also have extensive areas of uplands. And uh, this photograph comes from uh, the Wicklow Mountains National Park. But this is also a collapsed ecosystem because it was once forested, uh, like the rest of the country, different type of forest maybe. It probably had more uh, birch trees and fewer large uh, hardwoods. Uh, but it was forested nevertheless. It would have been areas of bog as well. And then the forests were felled. And up until relatively recently, a lot of people lived up in these areas where uh, there, there was um, uh, very low intensity farming, usually with cattle. Uh, but as the population diminished and uh, the EU came along and subsidies and so forth, uh, the cattle were replaced by sheep. And now we have uh, drastic depopulation in our upland areas. And in order for uh, the farmers who are still there to survive, they need to um, get the single farm payment, which is a subsidy, because sheep rearing is a loss-making business. And in order to get the subsidy, they're forced to, uh, to burn the land. Uh, and of course, a lot of these upland areas have been drained for uh, turf extraction. So, when you're looking at somewhere like this, particularly because it's a national park, people uh, expect to see wilderness. And a lot of people will still say that about places like this. But actually, very little uh, lives in this landscape. Uh, anybody who's familiar with the Wicklow Uplands, you know, you'll know that there are Sika deer there, which came from Japan. Uh, you'll also probably see a few ravens flying around. But the whole suite of native birds that used to live in our uplands, from uh, night jars and short-eared owls and ring ousel and curlews, all these birds are gone. Now, someone will correct me, because there are a few um, red grouse still living in the Wicklow Mountains. There are merlin and stuff. But the numbers of these species are far, far fewer than, than what uh, they were. So, uh, in my view, the entire upland and uh, uh, mountain areas in Ireland uh, are also completely collapsed ecosystems because they're utterly transformed. Now, within our farmlands, we have uh, an extensive area of, um, of rivers uh, that you know, rise in the lowlands and uh, rise in the uplands and drain uh, the lowlands. Now, um, 100 years ago, uh, one of the big problems that was identified for the expansion of agriculture in Ireland was uh, the rivers and their poor draining capacity. So, you know, people who remember from school that Ireland is traditionally shaped like a, uh, a saucer with the mountains on the outside and fairly flat in the middle, like, like Kildare. So the rivers don't really flow anywhere very fast. 
And, uh, and that meant that rivers would have had enormous floodplains associated with them. And that was a problem because if you wanted to farm the floodplains, uh, they, they, would, uh, they would do what rivers do and they would flood. So uh, shortly after the formation of the state, we set about putting large amounts of public money into draining our rivers. And uh, the red lines on that map, though, that, that is a screenshot from the, uh, the Office of Public Works. And the red lines and the blue lines show you the lengths of rivers that have been subjected to what's called arterial drainage. And this law dates from 1942, and uh, it hasn't been changed ever since. And these days, the Office of Public Works drains about 11,000 kilometers of our rivers, which are predominantly in the lowlands. And uh, what happens with a drained river is that instead of uh, slow flowing and meandering, the channel is deepened and straightened and embankments are created on either side of it. Now, uh, this is um, the River Boyne. This is a special area of conservation. But the River Boyne is one of the rivers within the arterial drainage network. And as you can see, it's as straight as an arrow, and, uh, and you can see the farmland that has benefited uh, from it on either side. But of course, it means that flooding downstream becomes more intense, and then during drought periods in the summer, uh, the aquatic life can become very stressed. So again, it's worth remembering what the definition of a collapsed ecosystem here. We're not saying the river is dead, but it is utterly transformed. It doesn't work the way a river uh, is supposed to work. And, uh, and again, if you remember the old diagrams from geography books, once the river hits the lowlands, it starts to snake and, uh, and meander. And I remember learning about um, oxbow lakes uh, when I did my intercert way back when. And uh, it was only when I later became an adult I wondered, why did I learn about oxbow lakes? There are no oxbow lakes in Ireland, um, because they've all been drained away and reclaimed. And of course, not only have so many of our rivers been uh, subjected to arterial drainage, but most of them are polluted. Uh, about 55% of our, of our river systems are polluted, and that's pretty much all of the rivers in the lowlands. And uh, the source of pollution is predominantly from agricultural runoff and uh, human wastewater treatment plants. And uh, so our rivers are polluted and drained, and the other big problem we have with our rivers is that they're dammed, so we have some big dams on a lot of our rivers, like the Liffey and the Lee um, and the Shannon and the Urn. And this means that uh, migratory fish can't access the river. So the Shannon, for instance, even though you, know, you still hear sometimes that the Shannon hasn't been drained, a lot of its uh, tributaries have been drained, and there's an enormous dam uh, at Arden Crusha at the mouth of the Shannon, so that very, very few salmon ever make it up uh, river uh, beyond the dam. Um, and of course, eels are critically endangered as well. So this doesn't affect just the species that live in it. It affects the whole way the ecosystem functions. Now, one of the problems we have also uh, that has affected uh, upland areas and, and many parts of the west of Ireland and uh, parts of our lowland area, particularly where we have peat soils, is the spread of uh, conifer forests. I don't even like calling these places forests because a forest is... A, uh, a complex ecosystem full of interactions between different species, whereas what we have here is a monoculture of a non-native species. Now, uh, it's important that they're non-native species, but it's kind of more important that they're a monoculture. If we were growing monocultures of oak trees, it would still be a difficulty for, uh, for the ecosystem. Now, one of the problems, uh, well, there are many problems associated with conifer plantations. The first one is that they're usually planted on top of a rich natural habitat. In this case, it would have been um, a blanket bog or a heath before it, uh, and so that habitat is gone. The other thing they have to do in order to, uh, for the trees to establish, they drain it. So they would uh, dig uh, deep drains and dry out the peat, and then they have to fertilize it. Uh, then all the trees are obviously of the same age, and because they're so tightly packed and they are um, uh, so uniform, they're very vulnerable to disease. This means that uh, quilche and uh, forest owners have to apply a lot of pesticides for aphids and various bugs and weevils and things like that. So these places get doused with uh, chemicals uh, periodically, that enters into our water system. It contributes to the collapse of insect populations, uh, as, as we spoke about. 
And then the final insult with these uh, plantations is that when they're felled, they use a method called clear felling. And that means uh, going in and taking down all of the trees at the same time. And that's what you see in the foreground there. And it's a pretty uh, post-apocalyptic scene that you're greeted with. This is so from somewhere in the Wicklow Mountains. But anybody familiar with these areas will, will see this on a, on a regular basis. Now, not only is that ugly, but it means that uh, when it rains, an awful lot of sediment then gets washed into the rivers. Um, that contributes to the problem I spoke about in the last slide. So uh, you're probably familiar with the freshwater pearl mussel. One of the reasons why the freshwater pearl mussel is on the verge of extinction is the amount of sediment that's in the water. And this is a big problem for many forests today that were planted, uh, many of these plantations that were planted, particularly in the 1950s and 60s, in places where even the forestry authorities today would admit were the wrong places to put them. So we're talking about places like Connemara and Kerry and Donegal in upland areas on peatland soils. And many of these places have freshwater pearl mussels in the rivers downstream. And conundrum is how are they going to fell the trees without causing this massive flush of sediment and silt into the rivers and choking the few remaining pearl mussels that are left. Uh, so that, that is, a, that is a, a big issue. And it is one that I think uh, we have a solution to, but I'll get to, uh, I'll get to the solution bit at the, at the end. And of course, the other major problem we have in upland areas is fires, and uh, certainly the last uh, five to ten years, every year has seen a fire season, which is something that is more associated with America or, or Australia to have an actual fire season. But uh, this picture is from Ackel, uh, Ackel Island. You can see the fire blazing over the mountain in the background. That's also a special area of conservation that is on fire. So many of these areas have been set on fire so often that it has completely altered the soil structure and the soil chemistry. And it means that the invertebrates living in it, uh, the birds that would have uh, fed on those invertebrates, they're all gone. Ackle Island is an extreme example because so much of its bird life is now extinct. But it's not unique. Uh, the Wicklow Mountains National Park uh, uh, has a very dedicated staff there who had been mapping where the fires were occurring. This was, these days they have satellites for doing all this, but in the, uh, up until recently they were going out with a GPS and mapping uh, the extent of the fires and when they, when they occurred. And when I saw those records, it was possible to see how everywhere in Wicklow Mountains National Park has been burnt at least once in the last 10 years, and many places have been burnt more than once. And of course, the ecosystem just can't, uh, can't cope with that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, fire. And uh, there's also been studies now from the UK where they do controlled burning. Now, controlled burning is a totally different scenario because, uh, as the name suggests, you're doing something at a very particular time and you're doing it, confining it to a particular area. What we have in Ireland is out of control fires, uh, which tend to rage uh, hotter and do much more damage. Of course, the other great ecosystem we have on land uh, in Ireland is our raised bogs, or at least where our raised bogs used to be. And this scene will be no doubt familiar to anybody in Kildare. A lot of the bogs in Kildare now look like this. And um, this is where our raised bogs used to be. Now, just to show you the extent to which our raised bogs have disappeared, the full uh, pie that I'm showing on the screen here represents the full extent of raised bogs as they existed. This uh, was the first study done on this in 1970s. I think it was early 1970s, uh, where they, they calculated the full area of the original raised bogs. Now, remember, Borden Amona swung into action in the 1950s. So you can see the very large slice is the amount of bog that had already disappeared at that time. Now in the 1970s was a time of ecological awakening um, across the world. And at this stage, in, we, we knew everything about climate change uh, that we do today. We knew everything about carbon sinks and about how important bogs were. And uh, we had David Bellamy and we had Dutch people coming from the World Wildlife Fund telling us that um, Ireland had a very important uh, extent of raised bogs in the world and that it was really important that we saved it. 
Nevertheless, you can see the green uh, cheese slice there is what was left by the 1980s. And uh, so very uh, little of it was left even at that stage. Now, in the early 1980s, Bord Nimona stopped uh, cutting over intact raised bogs. But at that stage, pretty much all of the raised bogs had been drained uh, in preparation. And we were still giving subsidies for uh, draining and cutting over raised bogs in the early 1980s. Um, but by the 90s, we, uh, the Habitats Director from the European Union came in. And uh, that, of course, was a fiasco because of the way it was handled. And uh, if anything, it encouraged people to go out to cut more turf on, on the few areas that were left. And the little red stripe you see on top is the remaining area of active raised bog that is left in Ireland today. Now, to me, it's practically an extinct ecosystem. Now, uh, that doesn't mean I don't think we should try and rescue what's left. What we have left is very, very important. But it's like looking at uh, a beaten up engine and trying to imagine what the car looks like when it was new, it's virtually impossible because so much of the elements of that ecosystem have gone, not only the hydrology uh, and the shape of it, uh, but also the species that used to live there are pretty much gone. Now, we now have, um, uh, we have all kinds of peatland action plans and we have targets and there are some projects out there. I think there's, there's one uh, there's a called a Living Life Project which is out restoring some of the raised bogs that were protected. But the level of ambition is to double the, sli the size of that red slice uh, over the next 20 years. So it still goes to show the enormous area that is still out there. Now, this is uh, calamitous from an ecological point of view, but there's also an opportunity in this, uh, which I will come to later. Now, when I, was, uh, uh, when I first got involved in, in ecology, uh, it pretty much, you know, anybody who learns about ecology in Ireland learns that Ireland is not a wild country like, you know, Brazil or Canada or something like that, that we don't have wilderness, it's a very managed landscape. But I always felt that surely the sea was beyond reach of, uh, of human industry. Uh, but I was wrong. And uh, what has happened in the sea has at least mirrored what has happened on land in terms of the destruction of ecosystems. Now for thousands of years, of course, as long as there have been people, there have been people fishing. Uh, but what happened was in the 1800s, the methods of fishing changed radically. Uh, up until then, all the fishing was done by people in small boats rowing out. It was usually men in the boats and women on shore doing the, doing the, the work of preserving and packing. And they were using nets. But then this innovation came called bottom trawling, whereby somebody hauled uh, a net across the bottom of the sea and it was fantastically productive. The amount of fish that were caught with a fraction of the effort from the rowing and the heaving was fantastical. And this coincided with uh, the development of steam power in boats. And so the amount of energy that could be applied into trawling the bottom of the sea really was extraordinarily profitable at the time. Now, it's very interesting looking back because the fishermen at the time could see the damage that this uh, was causing. And there were actually riots and uh, violence in Galway Bay over the incursion of trawlers, particularly because if you had a big steamboat, you didn't even have to be from the area. You just had to turn up before people got out of bed in the morning and you could do your damage and you'd be gone before anybody noticed. And this caused an awful lot of anger. But ultimately, the authorities were on the side of the trawlers and they felt that um, the traditional fishermen were standing in the way of progress. So trawling became more and more extensive. And uh, as the boats got bigger, so the engines changed from steam to diesel. And so as the fish disappeared from the very shallow coasts, the trawlers went further and further out to sea. So that today, really, if you're a fisherman in a small rowboat or a small boat with pots or nets, there are no fish left to catch. And that is not an exaggeration. The small fishing uh, fleece today 
relies on crustaceans, mostly lobsters and crabs. And for the big boats that want to capture fish, they need to go out very far to sea, usually factory boats or factory trawling. Now, the photograph on the right uh, was taken by a colleague of mine in the Irish Seal Sanctuary, uh, and he was invited out onto a prawn trawler in the Irish Sea. And this is the contents of the net as it was emptied on the deck. And when I saw it for the first time, I thought to myself, how could that be a prawn trawler? Where are all the prawns? And you can see, if you look very closely, there are some prawns here and there. But most of what's caught is the rest of the marine ecosystem. And they're mostly babies as well. There are baby fish, there's skates, and there's crabs, and there's other things in there. And they all get thrown overboard because they're not what the fishermen set out to catch. And there's no value in them. So everything else gets dumped. So it hints at the other major problem with bottom trawling. Not only does it destroy the ecosystem on the sea floor, but it's also associated with this gargantuan amount of waste that continues to this day. And most of the seas around Ireland are trawled like this at least once a year. We do have some areas that are closed to trawling, but, uh, but only tiny little fragments. Of course, the other problem was uh, on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, as you're looking at it there, you'll see a photograph from an angling competition from Phoenix in County Kerry. And this was taken in the 1960s. And in those days, uh, Board Falcher was going to great lengths to try and um, encourage tourists to come to Ireland. And one of the attractions was the enormous amount of fish that were in our seas. And particularly, anglers liked to catch sharks. And you can see the hall of sharks in front of the three men there. Uh, and in those days, the competitions ran. You, you killed the animal and you brought them back on shore. Uh, you weighed them and measured them and took a photograph, and then they were dumped back into the sea. The animal that is being held up by the man on the right there is an angel shark. Angel sharks are now critically in danger. The last survey for angel sharks uh, was in Tralee Bay last year, and they counted less than 10 of them. So I think we're actually lucky that we have 10 because I kind of felt myself they might have been gone completely. Uh, so there is still hope from the angel shark. But an awful lot of damage was done uh, from this. And one of the reasons why it was so easy to do so much damage is because a lot of these sharks that live in our waters grow to a long age and they don't have a lot of babies. So when you take a lot of them out, they're very, very slow to recover. Now today, even though I, I mentioned that there was a survey of, uh, for the angel shark last year, we still have no protection measures in place in Kerry for the angel shark. The angel shark is not a protected species in the way that badgers and hedgehogs are protected species because no marine fish uh, or invertebrate is, in a, is a protected species in Ireland. So when you look at that sweep that I've gone through, the farmland, the mountains, the bogland, the rivers, the sea, in my opinion, we are living in a totally collapsed ecosystem. Now, likely, this is not just confined to Ireland. It probably applies to much of uh, northern Europe and parts of North America, uh, etc. But um, I feel it is, a, it is a, a, a harsh reality. And really what it means, to go back to my, the question I posed at the beginning, why is our lives so good? I feel it's because we import an awful lot of the ecological damage. And that came home to me recently when uh, uh, it was revealed that an awful lot of the coal that comes in from uh, uh, to the Money Point power station in County Clare is sourced from an enormous pit mine in Columbia, which is associated with environmental destruction and human rights abuses. So while we've devastated our own environment, we're really just exporting this devastation out to other countries. And of course, with the ecological collapse comes extinction. Now, when I was um, researching my book, I found evidence for the extinction of about 120 different species. Believe it or not, it's quite hard to know whether some species have gone extinct or not. Sometimes species go extinct and they're refound. Sometimes you're going on a record from maybe 100 years ago of a plant or a moss or something like that, and nobody's really sure whether it was properly identified or if it was correct. But definitely 120 is a very conservative uh, estimate. Now, some of these species will be familiar to you, like bears, 
uh, lived in Ireland right up to about 3,000 years ago. That means they lived alongside human beings in this country for at least 7,000 years. We also, it's also believed we have links, although I have to say the, the evidence is pretty slim. Uh, wild cats, wolves, of course, are very well known to have been here up until the late 1700s. The giant auk. Uh, is the only species that I'm aware of that has completely gone extinct globally. And it was last seen in Ireland, probably in Belfast Bay uh, in the early 1800s. An awful lot of our birds have gone extinct. Uh, you guys will be f familiar with, with these. Um, Capercailles roamed the forest. The bitterns uh, were found in wetlands and reed swamps. We had North Atlantic right whales uh, that were hunted in Donegal right up until the early 1900s. And they are now completely extinct on this side of the Atlantic and are critically endangered on the uh, eastern side of uh, the western side of the Atlantic near the US and Canada. Uh, ospreys, it's incredible to think how ospreys are found in every continent in the world. Uh, they're found practically everywhere from the tropics right up to the temperate zones. Yet in Ireland, we, we, uh, we still have no ospreys. Um, and of course, the last bird that went uh, confirmed uh, to have gone extinct is the, is the corn bunting. So a kind of a small, inconspicuous brown bird after all those charismatic animals uh, that have gone before it. Uh, we know the curlew now is in tremendous trouble, uh, the corn crake also at very low numbers. And this is part of a trend whereby species are not going extinct maybe with the frequency that they did before, but species that were very common up until the 70s and 80s have literally nosedived in population. So the common skate uh, is one of those, an enormous fish uh, that was, that was fished out, the angel shark I mentioned. The European eel uh, was found everywhere. I remember as a child finding eels in, in the little streams in the Phoenix Park. They're now uh, critically endangered. The salmon, the nightjar is a bird that may well be extinct in Ireland. Um, nobody has seen it in years. It's not confirmed breeding in many years. And um, We've no action plans for it. There are no petitions. There are no threat response plans. Uh, it has basically just gone off the radar. Uh, the purple sea urchin uh, is, a, is a, a, a little animal that used to live on the west coast of Ireland. And that was driven to near extinction by just um, people going down and picking them up and selling them off. And of course, red grouse are also uh, very endangered. And of course, there are, uh, it's not just confined to, to birds and larger animals. This affects uh, bees and butterflies and dragonflies and mosses and plants. And pretty much everywhere you look, uh, there is an extinction crisis. Uh, from the information we have so far, we know that a third of everything on average that has been looked at is either threatened with extinction or near threatened with extinction. Now, that's all very heavy, sad, miserable news. And if I haven't depressed you, I haven't done my job, I feel. <laughs> and that was partly the reason why I wrote the book, because I felt people have to realize what has happened in Ireland. Because if we don't fully appreciate what has happened, we will never have the ambition to restore what we've lost. And that's a really important point. And that has come home to me, not so much in the last years, but certainly uh, five or six years ago, there was a feeling in the conservation movement, such as it is, that, guys, we've been getting it all wrong, you know. People are fed up listening to the bad news. It's all doom and gloom with environmentalists. We've got to change our message. So people started saying, OK, we'll stop weighing in on the bad news and we'll start doing all the nice stories and celebrating the conservation wins and celebrating what we have. And that hasn't worked either. So I'm back to where we started. I'm saying, actually, it's much worse than we ever thought it was. And we have to recognize that and wake up to it. Uh, but, and here comes the good news bit, is that that kind of uh, 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 bleak outlook shouldn't be confused with fatalism. What I'm not saying is that we're doomed. What I'm not saying is that it's Armageddon and that we're all going to die. Uh, what I am saying is that there are things that we can do uh, and things that we should do, but we have to get on and do them.
And at the moment, the really depressing part about working in conservation is that that sense of action isn't there. Particularly, I'm aiming that at uh, people in authority, uh, mainly our politicians. Now, we're all guilty to one extent or another. Any politician will tell you that when they go knocking from door to door looking for your vote, nobody ever brings up the environment. Nobody mentions climate change or curlews or any of that. So from the politician's point of view, there's nothing in it for them to stick their neck out. But that's where we come in. We have to plonk this on their agenda and force them to act. It is the only way that we will see any kind of improvement. So what are the things that uh, we should be doing? And really, it's not that hard. Uh, this is a photograph I took at the Loch Borough Parklands in County Offaly. And this looked exactly like the cutover industrial wasteland that I showed you a few slides back. Uh, up until uh, I think it was the late 1980s, early 1990s, when they decided to turn the pumps off and just let it go back to nature. And it has rebounded in incredible time, and, uh, and it is a wonderful place that is also extremely popular with local people. So peatland restoration should be uh, an absolute no-brainer in terms of some of the things we can do. The other thing we need to do is fall in love with trees again because trees are amazing uh, healers of our, of our landscape. And trees can go practically everywhere in Ireland. Uh, in our uplands, in our lowlands, uh, they can help in uh, intensive farming, they can help in low intensive farming. Uh, I think we should be looking at putting forests, real forests, back on our mountainous and upland areas. And one of the things we're doing at the moment in the Irish Wildlife Trust is working with communities who live beside these plantation conifers, conifer plantations that were planted in the 60s, to get Quilcha to convert them into native woodlands. Many of these plantations don't make any money. I'm convinced that Quilcha would be delighted to get them off their hands, but they need a nudge. They need local people to be pushing them. And, uh, and we're meeting with some success on that, uh, and it's early days. But I think there's huge potential uh, for that, that we could see all of those dark, dead uh, plantations transformed into native woodlands. So they're the things uh, that I think we should be doing. And of course, at sea, we have marine protected areas, uh, and there are things we can do there as well. So thank you very much. I hope I haven't depressed you too much. I hope I have um, uh, portrayed, or at least I hope I've driven the message that it's really important that if we care about this as much as a lot of the time we say we do, we have to get active about it. What I find remarkable um, among people is that how easy we say that, oh yes, absolutely, we depend 100% on nature, and then we go about our business as normal. We don't act like we meant those words, like we mean those words. And that's what I think really has to change if we're, if we're to turn things around. But uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.